I thought today we'd take a close look at the sampler workspace in Highs. I've touched on this in a few other videos and shown a few of its features, but I figured today we'd go right through it and sort of check out everything. So I'll put timestamps in the video on YouTube, so if there's a particular part you're interested in, you'll be able to jump straight to it. So the first thing is how do we open the sampler workspace? Usually when you are in your Highs project, you'll be in the scripting workspace where you have the interface designer on one side, and the script editor on the other. So to get to the sampling workspace, you can go to view and select show sampler workspace, and that will bring it up over here on the right hand side. And you could close the scripting window and then we get to uh, this view here. How I usually do it, um, let's go back to the scripting workspace first of all. Uh, how I usually do it is I'll go to the sampler I'm interested in. So I've got one sampler loaded here. And then I'll click this button here, which will open this sampler in the sampling workspace. So it does the same thing, but now we're looking at this particular sampler. And if you click on the sampler, you get a sort of mini version of the sampler workspace, and this can be useful for making quick edits. And we also get the sample editor if we click this tab here. So we get kind of a, a mini version. Uh, it's not so great for doing a lot of work. There's a table view down there but it's useful for making quick edits or finding out bits of information about the samples we have loaded. It's also handy if you just want to go to this menu here and swap out the sample map that's currently loaded. Okay, let's close this. We're going to work in the large version for the rest of this video. Okay, so I'm assuming most of you watching this are familiar with um, this sort of sampler layout. It's the kind of thing you've got in contact and most of the samplers, uh, but just to give you a brief explanation, so we're focusing on this lower area for now, but let's make that bigger. So this is the main mapping window, and the horizontal axis, all these sections here, these segments, they represent the different notes, and you can see them mapped along the keyboard here, so we've got a MIDI keyboard, and the vertical axis that represents velocity. So that's the standard way of laying out your samples in this sort of grid. Don't think you have to use the x-axis for pitch and the y-axis for dynamics or velocity. Uh, we're talking about MIDI velocity and you can use that to trigger any sample you want. It doesn't have to be a sample of a different dynamic. So you could have, say, didgeridoo samples down at the lower velocities and then pipe organ samples up at the top velocities. So you don't have to think of velocity as in as equivalent to dynamic. It's just a way of mapping the samples. So you use this grid how you want. And again, you don't have to use the pitches to map different pitches. You can just map different sounds to each one. And by thinking of the mapping grid in this way as just a, a place to put samples and organize them how you like, you'll find that you can do a lot more with it. For instance, you could do multiple round robins in a single grid or you could do multiple dynamics in a single grid or a combination or even multiple instruments or multiple articulations. So you have a lot more choice and a greater range of possibilities when you view this as a tool for organizing samples rather than just limiting it to pitch and dynamic. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just talk about the sample maps for a minute. So if you come from contact, when you map samples in contact, you drag your samples in, you lay them out in your grid however you like, and then they're trapped there. They're trapped in a group in contact on the mapping grid, and you can't do anything. You can't take them to a different instrument. Um, you can't edit them outside of contact, so it's just stuck in contact. With highs, it's a bit more like SVZ files, um, where the mapping is stored in a separate file. And in highs, we call those files sample maps. So you can map some samples in here. That mapping information the way you've organized your samples will be stored in an external file that you could just open that file in a text editor if you wanted to. It's human readable, so it's um, it's really great for debugging or, or making edits outside of highs. And then you can bring that sample map into a different project or you can swap it out within the same sampler. It would appear in this drop down menu if we had any. So it's more versatile than that sort of traditional thing of the samples are trapped within the specific sampler. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you how to map samples. So first of all, it's important to put your samples in the correct location. So here's the project folder for this little demo project I've got open in Highs. And these are all the folders that you get with your standard Highs project. And samples go in this folder, the samples folder. Don't put them in the audio files folder. 
don't put them outside of this project. Make sure they're inside the project and in the samples folder. And this will save you a ton of headaches. Um, and and it's, it's just the best way to do it. Just put them in the samples folder. So in here, I've got some Irish flute samples and I've got some oboe samples. And we'll look at those in uh, just a moment. If we go into highs and we go to this project directory tab, this shows that same folder structure we were just looking at in my uh, file browser. And there's the samples folder. So if I open that, there's our Irish flute and the oboe. So if I open one of these, I can actually select the samples in here. So I'm just holding shift and clicking to select which ones I want. And then I can just click and drag them across. I could also do the same from my file browser. I could select them and then click and drag them across. Another way to get the samples in is to right click and go to import samples. And this will open a file browser. And again, we could go to samples and then select the samples we want and click OK. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to map them by dragging them in. So I've got these Irish flute samples. So when you're creating your samples, the file names are very important, especially if you've got a lot of samples. When you only have a few, it's not so critical. But to quickly be able to map a lot of samples, you want to name them in such a way that you can use the auto mapping facilities of whichever sample you're using. But Heise's auto mapper is, will be quite familiar to you if you've used Contacts auto mapper. But it's a little more sophisticated than Contacts, as you'll see in just a moment. I'm just going to copy this file name and I'm going to put it in a text editor just so we can see the file name sort of on a single line. So this is just one file name. And this is how I've chosen to name it. So we have it in sections and the highs auto mapper is going to look for these underscores and it's going to read each one of these sections and it's going to refer to them as tokens. So we'll do the same. So each of these sections is a token and each token contains a certain piece of information. So the first token contains the name of the instrument. The second token contains the articulation. So this is a staccato sample. The third token contains the note number. So this is the MIDI note number. Now, some people prefer to use note names. I always advise to use note numbers. And there's two reasons for this. One is if you're doing any manipulation through scripting, it's easier to work with numbers than it is to work with letters. So if you just want to go up an octave, all you have to do is add 12. Whereas if you want to do it with letters, you have to do some string manipulation or convert it to a number and that kind of thing. So it's easier to work with numbers. The other reason is the MIDI standard puts middle C as MIDI note 60. But if you're using letters, middle C can be C3 or C4, depending on which system you're using. So it's not as consistent. But if you use MIDI numbers, you always know which note is mapped to which uh, number. So I always recommend to use MIDI note numbers. OK, and then the fourth token is the dynamic. So this uh, flute staccato sample is the second dynamic. So in this case, it's something like mezzo piano, mezzo forte. So that's my second dynamic. And the last number is the round robin. So for this Irish flute staccato samples, we did uh, four round robins. Um, so this one's RR1, the next one's RR2, RR3 and RR4. So that just represents the round robin number and then dot wave because it's a wave file. Now you don't have to use this exact naming system I've used. Um, this and I don't use this all the time. It depends on the samples. And the important thing is just to make sure the information is in here that you need to be able to auto map them. So if you had mic positions that would go in here, um, if you had sort of variations of articulation as they might go in here as well. So you might have staccato two or something like that, depending on how you've sampled your instrument. But just as long as you have the important information in the name and it's separated into these tokens using underscores. You can use different symbols, but underscores is the way to go. It's just the most reliable. Um, it always works. So that is the way I would recommend to name your samples, something like this. Oh, and obviously, if you've only got one dynamic and one articulation and one round robin, you could just delete all that and just have something like that, Irish flute. 62. So you only need the information in there that's actually relevant to what you're doing. Okay, so I'm going to map these samples by dragging them in. So we've got two dynamics in here, dynamic one, dynamic two, and each one has four round robins. 
So let's drag these across. And we'll get that out of the way. So now we get the file importer window, and there are various options here. You can have it automatically detect the pitch of the note to map them. You can have it just drop them where you drag them onto the mapping window. We're going to go with the file name token parser. So you see the word token there. Those are those segments of the name we were looking at. So I'll hit OK on that. That's just telling me that these samples have different names to the last samples I mapped. So we'll click OK. So it's showing the separator that's being used, which is the underscore. So this is where you'd change it if you were using a different separator, but I recommend always use the underscore. If we click the little help icon, it gives us some more information about the naming, pretty much the kind of stuff we've just gone over. So there it's telling us the name of the first file it's found. It's telling us there's 130 files to import, and it's found five tokens in the name, so five different segments in the name separated by underscores. Uh, we can save our settings, load our settings from a previous one, copy paste settings, those are pretty self-explanatory. So the first token is the Irish flute name. I don't want to do anything particularly special about mapping because of that token, so I'm going to leave this set to ignore. The second one is the articulation. Again, I'm going to leave it set to ignore, but if you were mapping different articulations to different groups or to different pitches, you would select one of the options in here. This one is the MIDI note number, and this uh, is, it says single key here, so this is probably because I've mapped similarly mapped samples before, so it's automatically using the previous settings. But in this case, it's correct. I do want to use the single key because this represents a single note number. And with it set to single key, it's going to map this sample. It's going to set the root note for this sample to 62. It's going to set the lowest mapped key to 62 and the highest mapped key to 62. So this one sample will just cover that one note, 62. In the data type column, I'm going to select number because we're using MIDI note numbers. And we don't need to do anything in these columns for this one. Okay, for the dynamic, we're going to put the dynamic across the velocity layers, and I've got two dynamics. So we're going to select velocity spread, and instead of number, we're going to select custom. And you can see this is where I was saying it's a bit more sophisticated than contacts, because with contact, you just have to put a number there, but with highs, we can put a string, so dynamic one, dynamic two, and it just pulls out from that the values one and two. So it's detected that we just want to use one and two. Okay, for the round robin number, I'm going to set this to round robin group and it's automatically jumped to custom and it's done the same thing, it's pulled the values out. So that's all set up perfectly. Now, if you want any more information about either of these columns, you can click the little help buttons and it will explain what all the different uh, values are for and the same on the data types as well. So there's plenty of help built in. Uh, this pool search behavior, I never use it. I just leave it set to search pool slower the pool is basically all the samples you've already got loaded. So if you select uh, skip pool search for duplicate samples, then I believe it will just allow you to import duplicate samples and won't reference ones that are already loaded. So it might use a bit more RAM or something. I don't really know, but it, it just leave that on search pool. Okay, and then we hit OK. And it's telling us we've changed the number of round robin groups, which we have because it was set to one and we've got four round robins. So we just hit OK on that. Okay, and then it's mapped the samples. Right, so this is the second dynamic. This is the first dynamic. We can see we're missing some samples, but that's okay. So now we can start exploring the mapping editor. So the first thing to do after you've mapped your samples is to save your sample map. So to save the sample map, we click the traditional floppy disk icon and we give it a name. So this is our Irish flute staccato. So I'm going to call it Irish flute staccato.xml. And I'll hit OK on that. So that's now saved it. If we go back to our project folder, Go back, there it is. Uh, it will now be saved in this sample maps folder here. So there's our Irish flute staccato sample map, and it's an XML file. And we can open this in a text editor, and it's very human readable. And this just contains the mapping information. Now, this will get more complicated as you do more stuff, like if you're bringing in multi mics or you're adjusting start positions and stuff. But the basic structure of the sample map is you have some metadata about the sample map, so its name the number of round robin groups, any mic positions you have. And then you've got an entry for every single sample. And it tells you the root note, the lowest key, the highest key, the low velocity, the high velocity and the round robin group, and then the sample itself. And we've got this wildcard here, which is automatically inserted for us. Project folder just 
tells Highs that this is in the project samples folder, which is where you should always keep your samples. And then the name of the sample, of course. And is it a duplicate? Are you using this sample multiple times? These will all be zero in, uh, in this case. And that's pretty much it for the whole sample map. So it's quite a simple structure, but it means if you need to manipulate things uh, in a sort of bulk operation, you're probably better off doing it in a text editor rather than doing it in highs. I often find myself doing that if I want to shift things. Uh, for example, if I decide I want to get rid of all the samples in round robin group four, I could do like a find replace and select them all, uh, that kind of thing. So we'll come back and look at this again when we've done some more complicated stuff later on. Okay, so back in our sample map editor. So we've learned how to save them. If you want to create a new sample map, we click this button here, click OK, and now we get a brand new blank sample map. And our sample map we just had is here, so we can reload it. Another way to create a new sample map is to press Ctrl and N, and it does the same thing. You can reload it. Or you can right click and go to New Sample Map. And again, it clears out the sample map. So three ways to create a new sample map. So we'll carry on with this toolbar actually before we go any further with the sample mapping. So again, let's just... So again, we'll create a new sample map. So the second button here is for loading an SFZ file. So if you have an SFZ, you can bring in the mapping data into this window. Now it won't bring all the opcodes and stuff. It's not an FFZ converter. It's just a tool to bring in the mapping information. So let's open up one of these SFZ files. And you can see it's kind of similar to the sample map in highs. So we have all the different samples. Uh, they, they each get their own entry, but SFZs typically have more information. So you've got this thing about groups and um, you can have control opcodes and stuff like that. And this is a very, very basic SFZ file. They, they're usually a lot more complicated than this and have modulator information and all, all sorts of stuff. But this is a simple one, but you can see it's laid out in a similar way to a sample map. So when we bring this in and I go to my desktop and I double click it, so it brings in the mapping information. Now these are all pink or purple because um, it highs can't find these files because I haven't put these samples in our samples folder. So you can see how easy it is to convert an SFZ file to um, a high sample map. So it's really straightforward. So let's uh, clear that out again. Uh, we'll go back to our saved one. So the next button, that's the save button. We've seen that already. This next button will encode the samples in the sample map into a monolith. So currently we're using WAV files, but it's not so great to ship WAV files with a sample library because they're quite large. So what you want to use is a lossless compression. And Contact does this, it has its own format. And another good format is FLAC. But HIS has its own format, which is based on FLAC. It's called HLAC. So if we press this button here, it's uh, going to ask us some things Say in the sample map. It's going to compress. Do we want to normalize it? This is basically saying, do you want 16-bit uh, or 24-bit? If you select full dynamics, it's 24-bit. And the split size is how large you want each compressed file to be. So if you have, say, five gigabytes of samples, it's going to be compressed. And if we select, say, the two 2000 meg one, it will compress the five gigs and split it up into two gig files. So uh, it, for, for this sample set, it doesn't matter because it's only a few samples, but usually you'd probably want to select two gigs. So we'll just hit OK on that and there's converted them. If we go to our project folder, click on samples, we now see this file appears with a .ch1 extension. So this is the compressed version of what's in here. So the file size of this folder is 31.8 megabytes and the file size of the compressed one is 17 megabytes. So that's not bad. That's a really good compression rate and the compression ratio will vary depending on the type of samples you're using. The CH1 on the end of here is saying channel 1. If you have multiple mic positions then each one will be given a different CH number. So if I had like close mics, decker and hall the close mics would be CH1, the deck would be CH2, the hole would be CH3. So that's all that number on the end means. Now when we did that, Highs has automatically loaded the monolith back in. So you can see there it says monolith. So we can't really make any edits to these samples now because they're loaded as monolith. We're not working with the original WAV files. And if we go to our sample map, 
we can see some extra information has now appeared in here. So it's added the sample end, uh, the monolith offset. So that's telling highs where in that single compressed file this particular sample lives. The sample rate, and there should be something else. There it is. This one, save mode. So the save mode is set to two. When it's set to two, that means highs is going to use the monolith and it's going to show a monolith here like we have here. If you want to go back to using the wave files, you can change that to zero, save the file. And then I think we need to restart highs. So we'll just close down highs and boot it up again. So we'll just go back to our sampler workspace. And you can see that monolith sign is gone. So now we're back to using the original wave files. But if we go to our samples folder, the monolith is still there. So we could switch back to it if we wanted to just by editing that number in the sample map again. So it's really nice and easy. OK, this next button is to zoom in and it's just a horizontal zoom. There is currently no vertical zoom in the sample editor, but you don't need it most of the time. So this is the undo button. This is the redo button. I think they're fairly self-explanatory, but just to demonstrate. So if we click undo, goes back, click redo, goes over there. We'll undo that again. This button is to select all. This next button is to deselect all. I don't know why you'd use those. I never use them because if you're in the sample editor anyway, you just press Control and A. It's probably Command A on a Mac and that will select them all. Press Escape to deselect them all or you can just click away from them and it will deselect them all. So I never use these buttons. This next button will uh, play back a sample. So, so this is going to be quite loud and annoying. So I've opened up this view here because we're going to need this button here in order to make it shut up. So I'll click this button. So now any sample I, I click on will play back. Oh, actually, these are only short samples, so it's not too annoying. But if you had a sustained sample and it carried on playing, you can click this button here to turn it off. OK, this next button here is to fill in the gaps between our notes. So you can see that um, some of these samples are missing. But if we wanted to fill in the gaps, we could do it manually by click on, e on each sample and then changing the note range. But a quicker way is to select all the samples and hit this button here and it will fill in those gaps for us. If there are gaps in the vertical range, let's just um, increase that. There we go. Um, you can click this next button here and it will do the same thing for the Y axis. So handy to use. I use it quite often. I don't use the velocity one so much, but um, yeah, it's still very useful to have. Another way to access those, if we just reload our sample maps, I'm just going to unload that and reload. And we select all these again. If we right click and go to tools and we've got these same options here, fill note gaps, fill velocity gaps. So we can just fill the note gaps there. OK, this next one is for velocity crossfading. So if we were to overlap these samples slightly, so currently we're on low velocity 64, high velocity 127. So if we uh, we can keep that on 64 actually, but if we raise this section up to 84, so now there's a crossover of 20 velocity levels. So we can sort of see that here in this whiter section, but we can turn that into a crossfade. So watch this here where it says low key and high key. When I click this button here, those values are going to change. So now we get low velocity crossfade and upper velocity crossfade. And if I click it again, it goes back. So while we're in the crossfade mode, we can select these ones and we can enter a low crossfade of 20. And we can select these ones and enter an upper crossfade of 20. So now we'll get a crossfade at those sections. So it doesn't look so pretty on the ones where the samples have been mapped across multiple notes, but it will sound all right. Even though there's a gap there, it will sound fine. So that's just a visual sort of glitch because we've spread this sample over two notes, but uh, this one is only going over one note and then this one's going over two, but in the opposite direction. So it's just a visual glitch. Don't worry about it. So we can undo that as well, either by selecting the samples and re-entering the values, or we can click the undo buttons and we'll get back to where we were. OK, these buttons here are for displaying the round robin groups. So we have four round robins and you can see this rectangle around here that's showing which groups are selected or which groups are displayed in the mapping editor. So if I click on this first one, 
And you can see the rectangle is now a square and it's just going around the first circle. And now we're only seeing the contents of the first group. If I click on the next one, we're seeing the contents of the next group and so on. So that's interesting. This group, for some reason, is missing uh, some samples. So in a real world project, I might want to go in here and find out what's going on and put those missing samples in here. And oh, OK, so it's the same with the fourth one. So what that tells me is for dynamic one, I only have two round robin groups. But for dynamic two, I have four round robin groups. If we want to view multiple groups at the same time, we can click one, hold shift and then click to select a range. If I hold control, I can deselect individual groups in this selection. The filled in circle inside the outer circle shows which group were, is currently active for when I'm playing back. So if I press a key on my keyboard, you're going to see this circle move. And for some reason, it's only jumping between groups one and three. I'm not 100% sure why that is, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this next button here, we don't click this one because it will cause highs to freeze at the moment. There's a bug in highs. But the purpose of this, when it does work, is when it's active, um, it will automatically display the currently played group in here. So it, this selection will always match. This last one here shows us which round robin group we're on. So you can see that's one of four. If I press a key, it'll jump to three or four for some reason. Um, and it shows us how many round robin groups we've got. If we click on it, we can change the number of round robin groups. So if I add, say, 50 now, so I click OK, you can see this circle system sort of breaks down visually. And this is kind of um, a glitchy thing at the moment in highs. There isn't really a good way to display a lot of round robin groups. So when you get to this stage, what you need to do is, if you want to select a different group, is you can right click on here and you've got a menu. So you can select any group you want. But um, it's it's not ideal, but it's what we have for now. So I'm going to change that back to four groups. And this last one allows us to lock to a particular round robin group. So if I don't want it to change group, I'll just click this. And now when I play, it's only going to stay on this group. And I can release. And now I can have it locked to group three. Now this lock isn't for production. You wouldn't do this in your final plugin. This is just for while you're developing, if you want to lock to a particular group so that you can play keys and hear what your samples sound like and make edits without it switching between groups. This is just a handy feature. So another way to do this is to right click and we can choose lock to the current round robin group. So in this case, it's saying three. If we go to a different group, now it says lock to round robin group one. So it's the same thing and this highlights again. We can also lock to a velocity level. So if we only want to hear these, this um, upper velocity, we can right click and select lock velocity at 104. Just the, the number is based on where my mouse currently is. So if I put it down there, it's 78. And then we will get a little lock icon here on the velocity range. And now if I play, it's just going to play the samples at that velocity. You'll see the actual played velocity jumping about all over the place as indicated by a little green line, but the actual velocity we hear and which is triggered is going to be where that line is. So sometimes your ears can play tricks on you. So we might be seeing the velocity and the sample triggering down here. And that might convince us that that's what's actually playing, but we can check because I've got a velocity modulator here. We can actually see which velocity is being triggered. So you see, no matter how hard I play, it's actually fixed. So sometimes it's a good idea to have a visual reference so that your ears don't trick you because you might be fooled. And then when we unlock this, right click, unlock velocity. Now we can see the actual velocity does move around. So again, just another useful tool for while you're developing your instrument. OK, let's move to this lower section here. So if I select some samples, let's select these ones. I can select which round robin group they're on. So currently they're on round robin group one. If I put them on round robin group three and hit enter, and now we go to group three, those samples are there and they're no longer on group one. I can move them back to group one. And they're back again. So this next one, I can change the root note. So currently showing the range of root notes for the selected samples. But if I select just one sample, the root note, it says is D3. So it's not using a note number, but if I select multiple, um, 
let's see. There we go. It'll use note numbers. And we can click these plus and minus keys to move the root note. And you'll see a little green indicator here on the keyboard also move. Now if you have multiple samples selected like this and you move them, it will actually move all of them sort of relative. So click that, it shifts them all up one or down one. So that's a great way for batch editing. So we've still got this low velocity fade and upper velocity fade there. If we click this button here again, that'll go away. And now we can select the low key and the high key. So if we want to shift the samples up or down, we can do that. And again, if you just want to work with individual keys, you can do that as well. Now let's zoom out. If you wanted to move these more quickly, uh, you can actually drag the samples around or you can right click on any of these input boxes and you'll get a slider and that's often a much quicker way to work. And then just right click again to get rid of that. Uh, the low velocity and high velocity, they're pretty self-explanatory, just moves them around in the velocity range. And of course you can enter a specific value in here if you want to. Okay, and that's pretty much it for this part of the sampler workspace. Now over here on the right we have a table view, and this just lists all the samples we have here, but it lists them in a single table. And this can be really useful because if you drag in some more samples after you've already mapped some, they will always appear at the bottom of the list. So this list is ordered by the order you've added the samples, and that can be really helpful if you need to quickly find the last group of samples you've added. Gives us some information like the round robin group, in fact let's just make that table full size. So we can see uh, the round robin group, the root note, the low key, the high key, the low velocity and high velocity. It's just for information purposes, you, uh, you can't edit it here. But the selection in this table here matches the selection in the mapping window. So this can be really useful if you want to select specific samples and you don't know exactly where it is in here or which group it's in, but you do know the name of it. You can just find it in here. And to speed that up, there's a search box here so you can type the particular name. So if I know I want note 85 of dynamic one, I can type 85 underscore dynamic one and hit enter. And it's showing me that there's two there because there's a round robin one and a round robin two. I only want the round robin one, so I'll add that. So now it's just getting the round robin one. If I want to select all the samples, I can put a dot or I can just leave it blank and hit enter and it will select all of them. And if I want to subtract a particular sample from this selection, I can type sub and then a colon. And then let's say I don't want any samples that have 81 in the name. So I'll type 81 and hit enter. And now all of those are deselected. So you've got um, some sort of regex type behavior here. And I don't know why that's saying one selected sample, I think that's a glitch. But if you want to see more of what you can do with this regex, you can click this help button here and it's got a little sort of cheat sheet and gives you some more information. To be honest, I don't use this very much, this regex stuff. I just tend to do more basic sample selection, sort of manually selecting things and holding control to deselect. But it, it can be handy to have that. Okay, before we move on, let's make a new sample map and I'm going to show you how to map some multi-mic samples. So we'll do this again through the file browser and I've got some oboe samples here. Now these are oboes, um, so it's oboe samples. I've got dynamic one, dynamic two, dynamic three. Yep, and a single round robin. And I'm just having a look and we've got decker mic, close mic and hall mic. So we've got three mics. So with the Irish flute, we were using the round robin groups to control round robins. And it was, that's how highs behaves automatically as we saw when we play, it automatically switches the round robin group. But you don't have to use round robin groups like that in highs. You can think of a group as just a, another tool for organizing samples and you can control them from your script. So you can activate a certain group at a certain time. Maybe you want it to be a different group for a different articulation or a different group for a different dynamic. And you can do that kind of thing and disable this default round robin behavior. So it's just, groups are just another tool for organizing your samples. So with these samples, because these are sustaining samples and it's an orchestral instrument, a woodwind instrument, I, I would use the groups for the different dynamics and then for crossfading. So that's how we're going to map them. And then we're going to look at the multi mics. Okay, so I'm going to drag these across, as we did before. File name, token parser. 
and we're going to ignore that one, ignore that one. We're going to ignore the close mic for now. We could set it to multi mic here, but we're not going to do it there. Um, so this one is going to be our note number. So we'll set that to single key and number, and we'll just clear out anything that's in these already. And dynamic, we're going to use round robin groups, and we just need to switch this so it's not showing those previous values. There we go. And now I've hit it OK on that. And it's found that there's loop points in these samples, so it's asking if we want to pull those in. So I'll click OK. Uh, tell them the round robin groups have changed again, so we'll click OK on that. OK, so now we've got three dynamics and each one is mapped to a different group. And these ones are working now. I have no idea why the others weren't. So, so yeah, so it's working in a round robin fashion, but in a real project, I'd set these to crossfade instead. But you can probably notice by the colour of these that there are multiple samples stacked on top of each other. So if I drag this one to the side, that's what an individual sample looks like. But you can see that there are multiple samples stacked. And that's because we've mapped multiple mic positions into each of these groups. There are three mic positions in each group. So going back to contact, if you've worked with that, if you want to do multiple mic positions, you would create one group per mic position and they wouldn't be in any way related to each other. They're three independent groups, but you'd kind of work them as if they were related through the way you scripted your instrument and controlled modulators and things like that. Hyde's a bit more sophisticated in that it has a concept of multi-mic samples. So what we can do is we can select all of these samples and we can tell Hyde's which one should be treated as belonging to a particular mic position. So we're in, let's go back to group one here. So here we actually have three samples stacked up, one for each mic position. We could tell highs to just treat this as a single sample, just bundle them all together. And any changes we make, we want it to be applied to all three of them equally. So we'll select all the samples, we'll right click, and we'll go to tools and merge into multi mic samples. So we'll click that. And now it's asking for the separator. So this is the token thing we had earlier. So it's the underscore. And then it's saying select which part of the file name is the mic position. So in our case, it's going to be close. And then it's saying select the detection mode. I always set this to mapping and file name. I don't think it actually makes too much difference. And then this information down here is saying it's found three channels, which means it's found three different mic positions based on the naming here. So it's, it's important that you name your samples consistently and make sure that the token order is the same. So you can see it's oboe one, sustain, close. The others will be oboe, sustain, decker, oboe, sustain, hall. So it's important that the naming is consistent and the length of each sample must be exactly the same for across the three mic positions. So you've got to be precise when you're cutting your samples and make sure everything's locked together. Okay, and then we hit OK. And now everything should be done. So now when I click on the first group and I move one of these out, it's just appearing as a single sample. But in reality, there's three samples there. And although we're treating it as a single sample in here, when you're doing stuff like um, adding effects or purging groups and things like that, you can work with the individual sample. So you can actually purge individual mic positions. So if we open the sampler here, go to sampler settings, and you can see where it says purge channel. It's actually listing all of them here. For some reason, the deck is purged. Let's load that. So there's our individual mic positions. We could purge all of them here. Could load all of them. And something else you'll notice is this little table here. This shows the routing of the channels. If we click on that, we can see our sampler has six stereo channels now, which is the, uh, the two for the close, two for the decker, and two for the hall. And then you could route those to different effects or different sends and that kind of thing. So even though within the sample map editor, we're treating them as a single sample, we can still work with them as independent samples as well. If we save this sample map now, which we probably should have done already, we'll call it oboe.xml. And we'll just have a look at that in a text editor. So we can see it's a little bit different to what we had before. So we can see our mic positions there. Close to Echo Hall, number of groups, same as before. But now for each sample, we actually have three files associated with it. So it's pretty much the same layout as before, but we've just now got multiple files associated with each one. 
If we select these again, and let's have a look at some more of the um, right click menu options. So delete duplicate samples, let me show you what that does. If we will just have the first group, if I select this sample, and I'm just going to right click and select duplicate. So now I have two of the same sample. If I select all my samples here, right click and select delete duplicate samples, it's going to delete any duplicates. So it's pretty straightforward and self explanatory. So that's useful if you've um, accidentally duplicated samples you didn't mean to, dragged in samples more than once and you just want to delete some of the duplicates. So handy little function. So we've got that uh, duplicate, delete, cut, copy, paste, they standard things with the keyboard shortcuts. Um, lock velocity, lock RR group, we looked at that. New sample map, load a sample map, save your sample map. Revert sample map will go to the last save state. That's just the same as reloading your sample map. Save as, so we can save it as an XML. We can convert it to monolith, which was that um, compression we did before. Uh, duplicate as reference, I'm not 100% sure what that does, but I think it basically creates a copy of your sample map. Import samples, we've seen that already. So we have the tools menu, fill note gaps, fill velocity gaps, we've seen those. Auto map using metadata will, um, if you've got loop points embedded in your samples and you press this, it will map those loop points into highs. So we'll look at loops in a little while. Trim sample start, this is a really useful one, which I use all the time. So if we click that, you can see that my samples start over here, but the actual sound is over here. So we've got a bit of a gap at the beginning. And I usually leave a bit of gap at the beginning because I know I'm going to be bringing them in highs to do the final tidying up. This has a list of all the samples and the currently displayed sample is the one that's selected. You can choose whichever one you want. Notice by the way that it's only showing the close mics now that we've uh, merged them into multi mics. If we'd have done this before we'd have done the mic merge, it would show all the different mic positions here. You always want to do your mic merge first because you want to apply things like this always to the close mics because the close mics are going to have the least delay of all the other of, of all the mic positions. So we can zoom in. Um, we can set this offset and this is what you want to choose. First of all, this is the how far into the sample it's going to search for the start of the sample. So I usually put it about there just sort of visually. Snap to zero, you want that on so it will snap whatever start position it finds to a zero crossing. That usually helps avoid pops and clicks. The start threshold is the sound level it's going to start looking at. Usually I put this between sort of 25 and 30. Uh, that's minus 25 and 30. The end threshold is for the end of the sample. I, I just leave that on minus 80. I never really touch that. And then the position to analyze, we can tell it which one. You always want to make sure it's on the one with the least delay, which is most of the time going to be a close mic. But of course, it's alphabetical. So if you've named it something else, then you need to select the right one here. And then just hit OK. And it gives you some information about what it's done. And now if we open up this sample editor, we can see the start positions of all the samples have been trimmed pretty accurately. So you might want to go in here afterwards and adjust it, but it usually gets you pretty close. And it saves you a ton of time when you're doing your initial editing. You can do, do more of a rough cut. Okay, I think that's covered everything in here. Let's see. Oh no, we've got these ones. Okay. So create multi mic sample map from a single mic position. So this is if you've only got one mic position, but for some reason you want that same structure we saw in the sample map for a multi mic sample map. I'm not sure why I'd use that, but I guess there must be some reason for it. Extract a single mic samples. This is basically undoing the mic merge. Reencode the monolith. So that's the same as clicking this button here. So it'll reencode that um, monolith, so click OK, and yeah, we got that same window. Um, what else do we have? Reencode all sample maps. So this is like a batch conversion. So if you've got multiple sample maps, it'll convert them all to monoliths. Now this seems to be a bit buggy at the moment. Sometimes it causes highs to crash, sometimes it works fine. So if it causes highs to crash, then you're gonna have to do it manually for now, one at a time. But hopefully this will be working fully again soon. Export AIFF with metadata. I'm not really sure why I'd want to use this. I guess if you've added loop points within highs and you want to re-export your samples, you'd use this, but I'll show you how it works. So you just choose a folder, hit OK. And then if we go to my desktop, it's now exported them all as AIFFs. So I'm not 100% sure why you'd want to use that, but it's 
It's there if you need it. And then the last option in here is redirect monolith reference. So if you have two sample maps that share the same samples, then there's no need for you to create two CH files. So let's say you had a staccato sample map, as we do here, and that's just your normal staccato articulation, but you're also using your staccato samples to create release triggers. So you'd have a separate release trigger sample map where the start positions of the samples are different, but you're actually using the same audio files. Well, when you go to convert that to a monolith, you're going to end up with two, um, two monoliths, two CH1 files. You'll have one for the staccato and one for the release triggers, but they're both using the same samples and there's no need to have two files. So what you would do in that case is you would select redirect monolith reference. It wouldn't be grayed out. In fact, let's convert this to a monolith so you can see that. Okay, there we go. So if I right click now, I can redirect the monolith reference and I can tell it I want it to use this staccato one instead of the oboe one. Obviously that won't work in this case because the staccato monolith doesn't contain my oboe samples, but you get the idea. It's a way of saving disk space and RAM usage. Okay, now we'll look at the actual sample editor. So this is a really useful tool, really powerful. Um, we're in monolith mode here, so I'm not sure how much of what we do will actually be saved. Uh, usually you want to be in wave mode when you're editing these with, with the raw samples. So we'll start off with these controls here. So each of these little boxes allows us to edit some parameter of the currently selected sample or samples. If you select multiple samples, you can edit uh, several at once. And again, right clicking on these brings up a little slider. So that, this one is for the gain, the volume of the sample. This next one is for the panning. So you can shift the pan. Uh, you have the uh, pitch offset. So if the tuning of your sample is slightly off, you can use that. Sample start, where you want the sample to begin and end. There we go. Sample start offset, so let's have a look at that. So you might be familiar with this from contact as well. You can load a bit of the sample, a bit extra of the sample into memory and adjust the point at which the sample is going to start dynamically um, from either a script or a modulator. So your sample doesn't always have to start from the beginning. So let's actually do that. So if over here I have this sample start section, if I click the plus button and add a velocity modulator, uh, actually let's add a CC modulator, or a constant modulator, even better. Okay, so I can use this slider now to control the start position of this sample. So we can see, oh, we've got round robin groups enabled. Let me just lock to that round robin group. There we go. So this green line represents where the start is happening. And I can shift it using this modulator. And you can do it through scripting, you can do it through velocity, you can do it through a CC controller. So that's what the sample start mod is for. Set that back to zero. Then you've got the loop start and end if you want to have loop points. Now, if you don't see any loop points in your sample, it means the samples that you've imported don't have any loops already in them. So to enable looping on the sample, if it's not already, you click this button here. And then you can adjust the start and end with these controls. And then you can apply some crossfading to the loop. So we've got a crossfade appearing there using this slider here. Okay, let's go to the top bar. So first of all, we've got to zoom in and a zoom out control. And that goes along with this sort of mini map view we've got here, which is really handy. And then we've got this button here and you can see it's currently an arrow. That means I can select the samples down here with my mouse. That's sort of the default behavior it's expecting. But if I click this arrow, it now becomes a MIDI keyboard. I can still select with my mouse. And I can also select use my cursor keys as well on my keyboard. But I can now also play my MIDI keyboard to select notes. So that can be really handy while you're working on things. So you might select the, a note, adjust the start position, select the next note, adjust the start position, that kind of thing. So it can speed up your workflow a bit. 
The next button, I don't know what it does, but it says enable single selection cycling with tab key in the tooltip. Um, but I've, I've never found out what it does. So I press the tab key and it doesn't seem to do anything. So that is um, a mystery control. But if you know what it is, leave it in the comments below the video. Okay, this button here will play the currently selected sample. And if I click it again, it will stop it. I never use this button. There is a better way to play the current sample. Just hold control on your keyboard or probably command on a Mac and then just click on the sample and where your mouse currently is, that's where it's going to start playback from. And then you release the mouse to stop. I find that so much better than this button here. Okay, we'll come to these controls in a minute. I just want to jump over to the right hand side. First of all, we can see our different mic positions. So we can see in the mini map of the close is a mono signal, the decker is stereo and the hall is stereo. If we select multiple samples, then we can actually select one of the samples from this drop down here. This slider will change between a waveform view and a spectral view. So this can be really handy, especially for finding errors or glitches or for finding where a sample ends for making release tails. Okay, this button at the far right, this will open the currently selected sample in an external audio editor of your choice. There's currently a problem though, if the file path has spaces in it, then it won't work. So you've got to make sure your file paths don't have spaces. Uh, but yes, that will open it. So like in Audacity or RX or whichever audio editor you choose. It won't work when the samples are loaded as a monolith. It only works with the raw wave file. So if I click on it, it's going to say it can't do it. Can't edit a monolith file. The way you select which audio editor it uses is you click to go into the highest preferences and somewhere down here, where is it? Ah, there we go. External editor path. So you just put the path to the executable of your audio editor. Okay, so these next few buttons, so the first one, this allows you to select the start position like you can down here, but just by clicking where this cursor is, and this can be really handy. So I'm just gonna hold control and scroll to zoom in here. So it's like using these buttons, but just with my mouse. And now I can click exactly where I want my start position to be, which is often a bit easier than dragging back and forth. If you enable this button here, it will lock this cursor to zero crossings. Let's see if we can find a better place to demonstrate that. Um, right, so if I turn that off, so I can put my start position right in the middle of this peak, for example. Now that's not a zero crossing. A zero crossing is where the waveform crosses the central horizontal line, and clearly this peak doesn't. Now if I enable this button here, it won't let me select the central peak so it's only locking to either side of it which is where the zero crossings are i don't know why you'd ever not want to be using this but i always have that button active because it will generally give you better results so you're going to re reduce the chances of getting clicking and popping sounds and things like that and this applies not only to what we're currently looking at which is sample start but these next two controls so the next one is the sample start offset so again it's like we have down here but it's a bit more accurate because you can zoom in and set it exactly where you want. And this one is for loop points. So if you click, it will put the start of a loop. And if you right click, it will put the end of a loop. And again, it's locking to the zero crossings because I've got this selected. Oh, I should show you as well with this one for selecting the start position. If you right click, it will set the end position. So left click for start position, right click for end position. Okay, so we're going to skip over these next three controls for now. We'll come back to those in a moment. Uh, so we're going to just stick with our loop points. So we'll add a crossfade here. So now we'll click on this next button. This opens the loop finder and we can zoom in on here. So this is showing the start position of our loop, the start of the loop and the end of the loop and showing us how it'll sort of blend together. If you click this button here, it will actually improve the loop points. It will try and find a good match for the start and end. See, it sort of shifted it over. And if we click this button here, we'll hear a playback of just sort of the loop section. So do you hear there's like a little bump in there? So we might want to adjust our crossfade or we might want to adjust these start positions and then try another find. Now we see that clearly isn't going to work very well. So maybe 
somewhere else. Looks like I didn't pick the best um, loop point. So that's probably not going to sound good either. No, but you get the idea. You can mess around here all day adjusting the loop points. And this drop down here allows you to adjust the resolution. So I, I usually just leave it on um, 1024. Once you're happy with what you've got here, you can click this tick button and it will apply it to the loop points here. None of this affects the actual audio file, by the way. This is all non-destructive editing. Now, so far, all of the controls we've looked at affect the currently selected sample. The next control, this slider up here, adjusts the loop crossfade. So we can see it's a linear crossfade at the moment. If I reduce this to say 0.5 or thereabouts, it's now going to become an equal power crossfade. So it's hard to see that curve so much on the white background. I don't know if we can improve that. Oh, if I remove the volume, there we go. So we can see it's an equal power crossfade now. So it'll fade that way on this side and we can't see it over here, but it's also doing the same thing over here. So we're getting an equal power crossfade. If we do it the other way, we get a sort of inversion of that. So all of these controls we've looked at so far have been affecting the individual sample. This one control here does not affect only the individual sample. It controls all the samples in the sample map. So if I now click on a different sample and apply a crossfade, you'll see it's taken on that same curve. So whatever setting you apply here for the crossfade curve, just the curve, is applied to all samples in the current sample map. Okay, let's um, go to the next one. So this control here, this is for normalizing your sample. And again, it's non-destructive. So you can normalize your samples here and un-normalize them. Now, another great thing about highs is you can actually create your own custom sample map editor. If you need to do some fancy stuff that isn't available here or through editing the text file, you can actually script your own editor. So you can add a script processor and in your script, you can do some stuff that gives you various controls for tweaking the samples. For example, I made a script that copies loop points between various samples, which is uh, something I needed to do. And one handy feature we have, if you're doing that, and it is a more advanced thing, so you're not likely to do it, but Christoph has added some controls just to make our lives a bit easier if you are doing that. So this button here will show the the interface of the first script in the sampler. So that's that script processor I just added. So if I was to add some buttons in here, they would appear here. So I'd be able to use my custom sample mapping tool directly here without having to open up a script separately over this side. I could just do it directly from here. And this button here will trigger the first button in that script if there were any buttons. Obviously, we don't have any but it's just a shortcut key. So I could have a button that says copy loops. And instead of having to open this and then click to copy the loops, I could just hit this button here and it would trigger that action for me. And this button can also be triggered using the shortcut key F9. So handy little tool. Okay, and then finally, we've got this control here and this is so useful. So we'll open this up. So this gives us a volume envelope for each sample. And you can just click on here and drag this however you like. So this is a really useful tool and we can right click on these to delete them. We can right click and drag in between to adjust the curve. There's a fade in and a fade out control. So we do that, click the tick button and it adds a fade in and a fade out to the beginning and end of the samples. And this gamma control is for the curve of that. So really useful thing to have. So we can turn that off again. And then we've got the same thing for pitch and this pitch envelope, you can control it manually. So you can adjust the, just the pitch, but let's hear that. Which sample am I on? Uh, let's choose a different sample. There we go. And now I can adjust the pitch of that. So really handy. Um, but it's also got an auto tuner. So if we just click this tick button, it's going to try and auto tune it and it's failed miserably over here, but it can be um, useful to get you sort of in the right area. 
if you do have a bit of pitch drift in your samples. But just as a general pitch envelope, it's uh, really useful. And then lastly, we've got a filter envelope. And I'm not 100% sure what the filtering is on this. I think it's just like, um, okay, 20 kilohertz. That was zero to 20 kilohertz, okay. So yeah, so it's a, just a filter envelope. Okay, so one last thing that I almost forgot. We've got the spectral view. If you click the three dots next to it, you can adjust the properties that affect the FFT calculation that produce this spectral view. And you can change the colors and things like that. Okay, so this has been a deep dive of the sampler workspace. And I hope that I've covered everything in enough detail to allow you to be able to use these features. If you do have any questions or comments or notice I've missed anything or want more information, please leave them below the video. I'm slowly approaching a thousand subscribers, so if you haven't subscribed already, please consider clicking the subscribe button and sharing this video with anybody you think might find it interesting or useful. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you to all my wonderful Patreon supporters. Your names are on the screen now. These videos are made because of your support, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.